Um, this event is co-sponsored by Hugo House, which gives away space and funding for literary events like this 50 to 60 times a year. Um, you can find out more about uh, the Hugo House Writers Fund through our website, and you click on uh, the link labeled programs, or you come ask me, and I'll direct you to somebody else. Um, <laughs> um, if you would like to know more about our classes, our hours, um, when you can visit our writers and residents, events like this one, um, you can write your information on one of the yellow sheets that I'm supposed to be holding, but I'm not, that are back there by my desk. And it's a, basically a free membership form, but also a way for you to get um, basic information through email, phone, or in the mail about us and what's going on here on a regular basis. So I'm going to stop my spiel because I'm done. But um, enjoy the show and have a good time. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha. Hi, my name is Bob Redmond. What an awesome sight to see a full house on Monday for poetry. And um, thanks again to Hugo House. I, I'm going to be your host for the evening, and I just want to make a quick introduction to... It really, it's echoes up here, so if you're, you can do that for me, I don't care. But if you do it for the poet, they'll get really distracted. So, um... In 1999, City Council President now, Nick Licata, started this program, and it's been through a number of incarnations, and it's grown each year. This is the seventh year for the Poet Populist election, and it's also a record number of attendees, I mean uh, candidates, and also nominating organizations. So good things are happening. And um, one of those things is that while Nick has been a supporter of the arts since even before he got elected and certainly in office, um, this is a program that has been mostly managed by his office, but this year it's starting to transition into a, a more sustainable long-term city project. So um, I think good things are in store for the poet populist in Seattle and also nationwide. And here to um, say a few words is City Council President Nick Licata. Thanks, Bob, and thanks for everyone uh, showing up this, uh, this evening as well. Um, as Bob said, we've been doing the Poet Populous now for seven years, but Bob has just been doing a tremendous job. We've really amped up the number of outreach. We, the voting is much greater than it was before. We have 16 great uh, candidates that have been nominated by literary organizations. I'm going to name off the eight that are speaking here this evening, but I also want to identify Frank Videos modestly standing there in the corners. He, he, uh, he's my legislative aide and also a part-time artist and was one of the people who really came up with this idea when we were sitting around one, one day thinking, what do we do to make Seattle even more exciting than it is now? <laughs> and we said, hey, I know, we ought to have a poet for Seattle. And they were thinking, well, you know, some cities have poet laureates, and the, and the mayor usually appoints them. And we're thinking, well, we don't want that. And we thought, well, I know, we'll have the people vote for a poet. And then, so we played around with the idea of how to get that word out. And what's happened then is that the people of Seattle, every year, you know, they go to all kinds of poetry events. They might belong to uh, organizations like Richard Hugo House, go to Poetry Slams, and say, hey, you know, I like this person. I'm going to remember it. And then they nominate them. And then we have a poet populist, and that person then uh, goes and does readings in public libraries and openings that we have for city events. Uh, and uh, we have, uh, have him or her uh, do readings at the city council itself. So, and if you're ever uh, into, uh, I don't know what channel it is, it does public TV, but um, what's, the, what's the channel for 23 or 21? 21. 21. 21. Um, and if you plug into the uh, city council committee meetings, Public safety has poetry readings at the beginning of each meeting, so it's, you can always check out your local <laughs> poetry readings. <laughs> For this, it's part of the public safety. Um, <laughs> okay, so I, I'm going to read off these folks and then uh, stop uh, killing the air up here. So um, the folks you're going to hear this evening are uh, Roberto Escalon. <laughs> and uh, if you're here, why don't you raise your hand or stand up so people yeah, get a yeah, yeah, yeah. right back there. Yeah? <laughs> And he was, he was nominated by the Youngstown Cultural Arts Center. We have Shannon Borg. Uh, okay. <laughs> right there. 
nominated by the Ruby Group and John Burgess. Yeah. Nominated from the ground up, Beth Coyote. Sounds like you brought a pack of coyotes with you. <laughs> Couldn't help that. Uh, nominated by It's About Time Reading Series, uh, Angela Martinez. Oh, right there, Henry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and she was nominated by, oh, Youth Speak Seattle. Great. Um, I was at Ballard High School that they sponsored the event, and that was really exciting. I hope you do it again. Ballard High School, I have to break here for a second, did this uh, evening of students reading their own poetry. And they had 500 students there. It was the most amazing event. So <laughs> you should do that. You should do that in every high school. Um, OK, uh, Richard Gold. <laughs> and he was nominated by uh, Pongo Publishing Teen Writing Project, which I think I was the, at one of your events as well. That's right. Um, and John Olson. Where's John at? Okay, right there. Uh, nominated by Filter Magazine. And finally, Cody Walker. Where's Cody? Okay, right over there, Cody. Uh, the Seattle Arts and Lectures. So, this evening could be a very fun evening. Bob, it's your stage. Thank you. Thanks to Nick. Uh, we also have a special guest tonight who is the 2005-2006 poet populist, Pesha Joyce Gertler. And um, Pesha kept one of the busiest um, poet populist schedules while she was in office. I'm sure you're equally as busy now, but as a poet populist, she was um, bringing poetry to the people, and, and she's a great populist herself um, in her everyday work. She's an instructor at North Seattle Community College and also a longtime and tireless advocate for marginalized and women's voices. She's co-founded the After Long Silence Reading Series and has been teaching grassroots, truly grassroots, for over 20 years. She's also been awarded a Hedgebook Writer's Residency and has numerous publishing credits, including in the Seal Press anthology, Backbone. Please welcome. Visited. That's about um, a fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen. Some of you may recall that. It's about, um, it was my favorite fairy tale, but I cried. I had, I had a house full of people, an extended family who read stories to me every night, but I cried every time they read the story to me. So finally, after I grew up, I decided I'm going to change that story, and that's what this is about. <laughs> the Little Natch Girl Revisited. I don't like to see her barefoot in the snow, standing in the alley, looking at the Christmas feast through the window, rubbing her hands for warmth. I like to see her going to the door and knocking. Like a child at the inn, I like to see her asking to enter. On this most appropriate day, I like to see her appropriating. And I like to see them taking her in as the center of their feast, the reason. I like to see them placing lamb's wool slippers on her feet and piping goose on her plate, steam pudding and later snuggling her into a quilt warm bed. I like to see her staying on, growing up, fed full of love and feasts, and building a home someday for match girls like herself, or fighting the laws that create match girls, or if they sent her away, said no, and slammed the door shut, and she had no choice but the choice she had, that is, to light all her unsold matches for one last moment of warmth. I don't like to see her frozen dead the next dawn. I like to see her taking those matches and lighting all of those houses, each one that said no, each one that locked her out and the building where the laws were made, and the houses where the lawmakers lived, until everyone was burning, burning, 
as she burned in the cold, white dark. <laughs> when people laugh during that poem, I always know I'm with a bunch of radicals, yay. <laughs> so, I have to read a couple of quotes to you. I want to read a couple of quotes to you. Probably you're familiar with them. But they, they seem to me to express so much what the poet populist is about which I felt was such a validation of my feeling of, of taking poetry where it isn't usually taken. And that, that's, to me, a, a central part of what the poet populist movement is about. So I congratulate whichever one of you wins ahead of time and let you, to let you know that this will be one of the most wonderful experiences of your life. First quote is by Ginsburg. I tear the do doors off their hinges to let the what? Excuse me, I'll start over again. I tear the doors off their hinges to let the wind and the cry of the world inside. And I feel that that's so much what the poet populist is about, opening up those doors and windows and, and getting out to as many people as possible who aren't normally included. And then the next quote is uh, by William Carlos Williams. It's hard to find the news in poetry, yet people die every day for lack of what is found there. And I feel that this is what the poet populist movement addresses, getting the poems to the people who are dying for lack of what is found there. Yeah. Very honored to be a part of this. And as you know, you're usually requested to write one poem for the city as a part of your role. And um, I thought a lot during the years, I'm sure every poet populist does, about what does it mean, and nominees too, what does it mean to be a poet populist? Then at a certain point, I began to think, what does it mean to be a poem? The poems had a voice. What might they say about this? And this poem came out of that. This will be the last poem I'll share with you. Populist poems in the city. Today, the poems walked out, out of the universities, out into the streets of gentrified CD, rainbowed Capitol Hill, Tidy Ballard and the Unbound Ave, shelters for the battered and street-worn, rest homes where elders are trapped in front of non-stop TV, sight boards where the soul journey is rammed into four-point restraints, the jailhouse where we punish the ones we have failed. The poems walked out walked out of the prison of ego, out of the tyranny of hip, into the labor room, the delivery room, the abortion room, where we decide when to say no, here or in the battlefield, when they grow up, if they grow up. Girl children, boy children, bombs do not discriminate, skin of all colors tears in strips, and poems contain them. If they're not in the poems, the poems will find them, hidden in the musty attic, the dank cellar, or the new condo with the lakefront lanai. The poems want to roller coaster or glide in the open daylight with Basho, Ferlinghetti, Amichai, Rumi, Whitman, Oliver, Lord, Sanchez. Sometimes the poems scream, though no one hears in Washington, D.C., where they live inside limericks built with tongue twisters. Sometimes someone listens and paints a new vision on the walls of our lives, outside the high offices of business tycoons who own the country, the rich with their estates and villas built with funds stolen from the poor. Yes. Let the poems take you where they want to dance, drunk with the joy and pain of the human story. Not in a safe room with an antiseptic persona and gleaming plastic. Have you noticed how sometimes the poems sit down beside you in the drunk tank, the park bench, the staircase in low rent housing? Sometimes the poems walk down the long hospital corridors, and pause beside the beds where patients lie alone in the night, waiting for the next pill, waiting for the next pain-free breath, waiting for the goddess of mercy in blue silk kimono, or the goddess of death in tattered jeans. 
The poems wait too, with their late night gifts, a crimson rose of peace, sips of melting Rainier Mountain snow, rolling music of ocean waves, a late winter promise of crocus, the fragrance of cedar and sky on summer wings of birds. Follow the poems to the patient's bedside, for you are the patient. And listen while the poems whisper love, whisper light, whisper own. As a Joyce Gertler. So thanks for those quotes and especially for the poetry. The quotes reminded me of Walt Whitman and his poem, I Hear America Singing. That's what we're trying to do in this program, and thank you for embodying that, Pesha, and, and to all of the poets who are about to read tonight. Oh, I thought that was Ken Waldman from Alaska back there. Um, so we have 16 poets in the election, and eight of them are going to read tonight. The other eight read last Sunday at the Seattle Public Library. There will be, um, there is voting, as many of you have already have voted, and that voting ends on August 15th. Between August 15th and uh, the 1st of September, we will tabulate the responses and invite the top four vote getters to read at Bumbershoot on the 2nd of September, and, and at that point, um, the winner will be announced, and that person will be the new poet populist. But as uh, they say in the slam, it's not about the points, it's about the poetry, and everybody who is participating in this whole project wins, and we're happy about that. I do want to say, though, that, that we also have to get people to participate, and already we've gone farther than any other election we've had. There's already been more votes cast than this one, but we want to go over the top. So um, that's when you go out of here, take that message to other people and new audiences and say, check it out. So we'll have a sampling tonight of eight of the poets. Uh, we'll go through them in alphabetical order. You'll each have seven minutes to read. Don't, please don't make me get out my hook. <laughs> the first is Roberto Ascalon. Yay! Roberto was nominated by the Youngstown Cultural Arts Center. Uh, born in New York, he's a poet, writer, arts educator, and spoken word performance artist. He lives at Youngstown, um, the Cultural Arts Center in West Seattle. He also uses his love for the craft of poetry to transform the world that surrounds him. He connects with audiences via universal narratives that encompass topics like racism, first kisses, love, family, and spam. Please welcome Roberto Ascalon. What's up, Angel? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a real honor. It's a real. It's a real honor. <clears throat> um, I think we're going to begin with a, a piece about. Um, living on Beacon Hill. It's called Cicada Nights. On those nights, it was like we danced barefoot on hot gravel. Wiffle ball, bat smack, home run, puts you in the Johnson driveway. And turning around third base at full speed means you gotta jump over like 10 miles of pricker bushes, fat with blackberries. Those nights, Levi and James would always try to sell stupid shit. <laughs> shit like used batteries and half-off dry-cleaning coupons to old Mrs. Tran, who lived down at the condos, the new ones with the new built-in porches. Half of the time, she'd chase them down the block with a broomstick handle. And the other half of the time, she'd give them kisses and glasses of tang and buy whatever, whatever they were selling, depending on whether or not Mr. Tran had visited the racetrack or the liquor store that week. 
So broomstick or not, was well worth the risk. It was always worth it for us, because seeing them get smacked upside the head and the funny shaped bruises that came up an hour later always had Jenny Lee peeing her pants laughing. And that way we had three people to bust on all night long. <laughs> on those nights we threw itchy balls at the cross-eyed cats by the cul-de-sac because we hated them. We hated them. We hated the way they stared blank and bitter at anyone on this side of the cyclone fence. Those nights, we ate Otter Pops bought from 7-Eleven and stole beer from Mario's dad's basement fridge. Those nights, we jerk off to the torn covers of penthouse magazines by the dumpster weighed down by the park side. Those nights, we'd walk for half an hour to get to Greg's pool, the one where, if you were brave enough, you could jump from the branch of the dying oak, the one that broke the night that Fat Paul tried to do like 500 pull-ups in like four minutes. Those nights we tease Sherman, call him Sherman the Vermin from behind the old dahlia bushes till the one day his mom threw boiling water at all of us and nearly blinded poor Lisa Randall. Those nights we try for hours trying to make fire with two sticks, Indian style. We try to make light with nothing, nothing, nothing but ourselves our green, young selves. So, I'll do another one of the pieces that a lot of people have heard probably. Um, let's see. This is, this is about spam. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, not the email kind, but uh, the actual spam kind. <laughs> Stuff that you eat. You know, I remember the first time I came to Seattle, um, there was a spam carving contest. And it was advertising the stranger, and I was like, oh man, what are they gonna do with all the spam that's left over? <laughs> I was like, wow, I'm a little hungry, you know? My father's love is a fried Spam sandwich on Wonder Bread with extra mayo <laughs> all wrapped up in aluminum foil. Spam is my father's version of Catholic communion. It's his way of saying, I love you, which I didn't hear very often when I was growing up, but I ate a lot of Spam. In church, you eat the body of Christ and receive holy life eternal. With Spam, you eat pork that stays good in a can forever. <laughs> it's more than a salty pork product, though. It's bacon on steroids. A reconstituted luncheon ham and a doomed love affair with a dead sea. This is Sunday brunch at its finest. Garlic fried jasmine rice, eggs sunny side up with the edges browned to a fine crunch, and my Favorite, golden brown leaves of thin sliced Spam fanned out like a deck of cards. <laughs> and it's a fact, Filipinos love to eat canned meats. It says to the neighbors, I'm rich, I can afford to buy meat. American meat, no less. But I wasn't born in the Philippines. I grew up in New York City where nobody really ate Spam. Back home, it was a joke. A sign, a tattoo, a tell, a mark. Spam, you see, is kitsch. It belongs in the secret stash of a 50s fallout shelter in between the iodine and the shotgun shells. But the truth is much deeper. Because it's not food, it's irony. Spam is the first animal that man ever invented. Spam is G.I. Joe's favorite dinner. It's what the people get after their livestock have been slaughtered and all the able-bodied men killed. Spam goes great with a scorched earth policy. It's the meat that comes after the war. Maybe that's why Southerners love it so much. I can still see my father's face inhaling the sizzle hot, turning the crackling slices over and saying, you are going to love this. And at school, I held my knapsack close so the other kids couldn't smell my house as I walked down the halls. 
I thought I could smell the hangdog look in my father's eyes, taste the history of the yesterday's fry pan. You see, spam is class in a can, the mark of the colonizer, a metal brand on the inside of my tongue. It's the love of my father, deep fried in bacon fat. Spam is the shame of animals not knowing the names of all their parts. It's the salt flesh of yesterday's American colonial expedition surviving, surviving heat wave after heat wave after heat wave in the equatorial pantries of my father's homeland. Spam is a brick of pink gold worth just as much in those equatorial heat waves glistening in the merienda afternoon. Spam is the American flag come home to roost in my palate, taking up residence in my arteries. The last hundred years of neo-colonial foreign policy bumping up your insurance premiums. <laughs> Spam is the export product that Iraqi children will ask for by name. Hmm. Spam is my father's fatty love. It's the rosy pink that says, I care, straight from the pigs of America's heartland. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto Ascalon. Shannon Borg is the next poet on tonight's bill. She holds a doctorate of poetry from the University of Houston and an MFA from the UW. Her first book of poems, Corset, was published by Cherry Grove Collections in 2006. She's a member of the Ruby Group who nominated her, and they are a group of local poets promoting spontaneity, collaboration, and open exchange. Please welcome Shannon Borg. Vote for Roberto. <laughs> that was awesome. That was great. Uh, thanks so much. This the great thing about this is that, as poets, we get to hear and read with poets that we might not have got to know, heard, or read with in other situations. <laughs> Last week at the library, it was amazing. The diversity and the age groups, the cultures, and you know that everyone was from and represented, and it was it was just really cool to see that. <clears throat> so, I'm just really happy to be able to be here. Um, one thing I want to say is thanks to Hugo House, thanks to Bob and, and everybody who's you know, put this all together. Um, and Pesha said something that Bart mentioned last week, that you know, if, if they ask you, write a poem for whatever occasion you're called upon, and I think one great thing that could come out of this is that all the poets in this room and in this program write poems for our city and get poems out there about and engaging in our city. And I think that's what this program really is accomplishing. So my poems, I guess, sort of try to capture my life in moments, you know, and in the moments that I live, um, in the places that I love, and I'm going to start with one in the old peculiar, some of you might have been there, near the end of the century. Seven of us sat near the window, our hands curled around imperial pints, while the late sunlight reddened us through the wobbly window, 3 p.m., and already too late to get into the popular bars, all of us sitting there just staring at each other, or out the window at the still dead trees just rain, rained on, till drops of sweet liquor fell far enough into our individual darknesses to land on something, a lost pool began to ripple out. It was the place none of us had been in a long time and feared, where the women of us wanted to kiss strangers. No, never marry, just kiss them, though they looked like our fathers, and the men of us lost the desire to kiss the women of us. We all just lost something we knew we should have, but for one minute forgot about and spent the remainder of our lives trying to get back the glance from the ones we would never stop wanting, but would never have the way their hair 
fell over their faces, their shirts fell off their shoulders, the leg curving down into the boot and that place behind the knee we know is tender, the inside of an arm, the pale skin we forget about all day until the light is gone, the only light, a glass of beer, red on the table, rippling in its heavy glass, wanting to get out. <laughs> Um, wow, this is just cool. I love Hugo House. And, you know, this is, this is the heart of the city right here. You know, don't, it's, there's so much goes on here. It's, it's fun. The Fog, a little weather poem for us in this past week. Every morning the water's new. Today I walk out onto the wooden dock and the land behind me disappears. Pale gray sh shroud, veil of fog forms this world, empty scape of land, and I'm standing in nothing, on nothing, but morning's dream of itself. I sing to call you, blue moon, you saw me standing alone, and the cloud's white answer is silence. Do you see me standing there, small and waiting for the day's language? The water's surface is a sheet of silk and I want to walk out onto it toward you, but some seagull in my brain knows I'd sink down into that dark and shifting mirror with the seals and the blind fish and gardens of olive kelp streaming out like a girl's hair. Others have drowned before me by moving there. And so I am still and I search for a horizon, the blankness, something for my eye to love. Finally, a black star in that empty morning, floating, growing from a pinprick in the middle of the sky to a speck, a jot, a tiny carapace, the shape of an insect's soul, a boat, small oars rising and falling to touch a mirror image of themselves. This boat fills my eye, and I am singing you toward me. You're carrying the day astern, growing larger until I can hear the oars dripping and the muted splash along the gunnels, and then your face rises to meet mine, as when the sun breaks the horizon and the day becomes day, morning floating away to find another for form, a boat to carry it again. Um, gosh. Yeah, one. Um, okay, one more. Okay, I just have to do another bar poem for many people who know this place and who have been there. Friday night at Il Bistro. Uh, every drink in here is from Mr. Boston, Boston's official bartending and party guide. The man at the bar tosses back double screwdrivers as I sit down beside him on the only empty bar stool. Murray is behind the bar tonight. He mixes a gimlet and sets it down without a word. He's a wizard at the art of concoction without the, with the aid, without the aid of fingertip indexing. He knows the answers to my question. How much is a dash? What's in a nightmare? The stranger suggests a virgin or perhaps a bosom caresser. Murray says, why not start with a silver bullet, move on to a leave it to me. I look for another place, but I want a kiss in the dark, a hasty affair. I am keeping this to myself, and Murray leaves the screw out of the next screwdriver. The stranger says he will never again drink a third degree honeymoon cocktail, and I know what he means. He leans into a pool of light, scribbles his number onto a matchbook. I'm looking out the bottle bottom window at the empty brick alley where the moon is casting shadows as the bartender shakes up another thunderclap and in the light of the latest development, the velvet hammer on the rocks. My glass is empty and next is a foghorn or perhaps a red cloud, but what I need is an answer. How to concoct a calm voyage? How do I begin? Thank you. Thank you, Shannon Borg. Are people stuffy? Is it too hot? Richard, could you see if that window opens? Um, um, after I introduce the next reader, I'll see if we can get some more air coming in through here. The next reader is John Burgess. 
He was nominated by From the Ground Up, a uh, relatively new organization. And uh, John grew up in upstate New York and worked on a survey crew in Montana and taught English in Japan. He now works nine to five in corporate communications for an insurance company in Seattle and rides the bus to work every day. He's a 2006 Jack Straw writer and co-founder of the Washington Poets Association's Very Fine Burning Word Festival on Whidbey Island. He's also the current editor of Snow Monkey Literary Journal. Please welcome John Burgess. This country would be better off if we all listened to artists the Spoon Man. Man, when he plays, beats his body, claps, slaps metal and bone like a splash of cold water on the face of America. His works, unbridled staff, spread on dirt, stolen silverware from the bare cupboards of America. He builds a soul from the ground up, whips himself, rips rhythms from anime clay, clogs unshod, shackled with gold, dances on gray cement among pipes bent by development, rattles hunched but unbroken, shoot straight up, electrons of percussion fly from his body, this instrument of America gives it to us direct, measures out our medicine, spoon by spoon. I was nominated uh, by From the Ground Up, and they publish a, a lit journal, When It Rains From the Ground Up, and they also sponsor this great uh, cheap wine and poetry night. So check it out, if you haven't checked it out, the next event is uh, August 2nd in uh, Pioneer Square. It's gonna be, uh, gonna be a lot of poetry and a lot of cheap wine, I mean, not just kind of <laughs> Here's some uh, new poems that uh, were published in the last edition. Agona. Buildings are gonna come down, mama. Crowds and clouds be a gathering, be watching a whole thing burn. What rains, rain are gonna wash away. Floods are rising higher than barbed wire. Nothing can resist are standing against uprising. Write, darling, when you get to Haiti, rebel postcards that reveal state secrets, disclose who's sleeping with liberty, who below your balcony calls with rifles. Capture romance of a people's general, sign your name in blood by lantern light, cover up with a blanket of insurgency, coupled at port until reveille's release. For five blocks, he wonders how the elk got there. The only way into the city from the mountains is Interstate 90, so he guesses they took the commuter lane, rode someone's ass all the way to town, used their antlers as horns. When he spots them, they're grazing the green belt at the north end of the community college. His peripheral vision catches the sandy brown of elk hide against a row of poplar trees that buffer traffic noise. They're chewing as if counting to 15 before swallowing. Everything else rushes by too fast to notice the care they're taking. In fact, by the time he stops at the traffic light just five blocks away, He's no longer sure he even saw elk. <laughs> I'll end with an imperfect sonnet. Since you left, I've been as lonely as a Johnny Cash song, solitary as a man without parole, no more appeal. As sad as a train at 4 a.m., pawned my wedding band for an acoustic guitar, strummed Ring of Fire, learned to rhyme, earned my forgiveness, one song at a time. Thank you, John Burgess. So this postcard has the most dangerous word in the English language on it, vote. 
not so much for this election, but, but for our country. And this election is just a small practice of how we can convey that importance to people around us. And, and not only that, but um, also using our voices. So again, thanks to everybody here for doing that. And uh, there's some postcards by the video cameraman. Thank you, Channel 21. Um, so if you're a poet, if you represent an organization, if you have a place to uh, put these, pick them up on your way out. Beth Coyote was uh, nominated by the It's About Time reading series. She's a midwife, gardener, grandmother, painter, and community activist. She helped edit the Poets Against the War website and Voices in Wartime education project. She has stood with women in black in the Westlake Mall, organizes Change Your Mind Day, an annual poetry reading for local Buddhist groups, and laminates poems to display on trees. With the Garlic Gulch Poets, she helped form a monthly writing series in Columbia City. Please welcome Beth Coyote. Thanks. I don't know if any of you knew a writer named Nagest Ababesh. She died in March, and uh, I'm dedicating this reading to her. She was also a community activist of the first water. I also miss this guy. Please, please, please. A guzzle for James Brown and the famous flames. Hair is the first thing, and teeth the second. Hair and teeth. A man got those two things. He's got it all. James Brown, godfather of soul. Who protects the ecstatic, crying, shimmer me, Jesus, as they cross the Jordan, kiss the knees of Jesus? James shook the hi-fi, chairs strike back. The curtains did a little shimmy for the polyblend Jesus. James made the girls growl up the alleyways, look right, left, into the blind-eyed Jesus, I feel good. Trumpets broke ears of the dodgeball boys, fine and pointed Italian shoes, sexy Jesus. All spangles, sequins, gold teeth catch him faint. Famous flames purged a rock and roll gospel for Jesus. James screeched and scratched our brains, our joints, cook roadhouse, sweaty thighs, highfalutin Jesus. 3,000 pound gold casket, flame jacket, sparkle shoes, carry our king away, don't drop him, sweet Jesus. Papa's velvet pompadour, oily stage floor, cape him, comb him, stroke his, tumble me, Jesus. Open Apollo, open your doors, wide to the stagger, we come run, stretch, scratch the itch, thorny Jesus. Thump the floorboards, crash chandeliers, swing out, swagger sound, flow the harsh, soothe, mutter, Jesus, we can do the rumpus. Bend over backwards, our faces grind up, hands higher than Jesus. James, halo, holy, flash, hips extravagant, got a brand new bag, taken up on arms of Jesus, who will come for us, mourning his high, Coyote does the fandango, spine shiver, Jesus. In the last 24 hours, I have been to a funeral, moved a yard of topsoil, meditated for 40 minutes, made rice pudding with a mashed banana in it. Which order would you like these items in anyway? Easiest to hardest? Less emotional to more emotional? Well, the rice pudding was a mistake, and it overflowed in the oven and burned on the bottom and set off the damn smoke detector, which will not go off if the house is really on fire. I just know it. <laughs> Meditated, counted the breath, noticed many random thoughts, back to the breath, observed my knees beginning to hurt, back to the breath, thought about dinner for a while, back to the breath, etc. Had about seven minutes of mindfulness. <laughs> Do you really want to hear about moving topsoil? It was raining, the dirt was heavy, and I was wearing flip-flops. Not a smart shoe choice. Oh, the funeral. I can't be serious. She was a good friend, a writer, a black writer, and the funeral had ministers and people in the audience saying amen and Jesus and 
Her mother looked just like her, only older, and her twin sister didn't look like her, but she thanked me for coming. I cried so much I got a headache and there was dried snot on my hands. My friend was such a decent person, a really kind person, and I was feeling like, crap, now I have to clean up my act because I can't coast on her goodness anymore because she's dead forever. I can't believe it. I wake up in the morning and she's still dead. That's the part they don't tell you about where you don't really accept it and you just want to go to the person and say, get up, stop scaring us, this isn't funny anymore. I'll end with this one. Objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. If my father were here tonight, I would ask his opinion. I would show him a few pictures of naked men kneeling. They are not at prayer. They are kneeling on their naked knees. There are others in the photographs, uniforms, boots, and yes, dogs. Dogs very close to the naked men, naked men whose eyes are covered. We cannot see their faces or their privates. Those are blacked out. Because to see their privates would be obscene, so the naked kneeling men could be holy. Because their faces, their genitals are blank, we see chest hair, fingernails, buttocks. Those parts are not obscene, so the holy naked men kneeling before dogs, uniforms, in their anonymity, anonymity would want to live like us. They will be holy naked, kneeling. They want to live because life is sweet, strange, blessed in their nakedness, blessed their skin, their tender fear of dogs, boots, the language of foreigners. What of my father? Is he in the picture with the naked men? Is he wearing boots? Is he laughing? Does he hold a leash? with a dog at the end, or a leash with a man at the end. Can I join the naked men on my knees, ask for forgiveness? Is this forgivable? Hotly, we murmur, we kneel down. Our innocence, our guilt, my brothers, our fear, cover us like a holy veil. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. Some, some of the poets who are nominated work for an organization, and you might see their name and say, oh, but they work for that organization that nominated them. And here's what happened, is that the boards of those organizations thought so highly of the, the poets who were the administrators, or the administrators who were the poets, that they nominated them. Nobody nominated themselves. And um, so much respect to the poets in that category. Angela Martinez D. was nominated by Youth Speak Seattle, who um, just got back from the youth national event in San Francisco and bringing up the next generation of poets. Angela was one of those poets, and she's been performing since she was 14 with Isang Mahal Arts Collective. And also Youth Speaks, she's taught poetry and performance at high schools, universities, and other venues across the region, and now is currently in her second year as writer-in-residence at Chief Self High School. Please welcome Angela Deep. Pleased to be here with you all tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming out. It is lovely to see the Hugo House full like this. Um, as Bob said, I did just get back from the Youth National Poetry Slam and Festival happening in San Jose. Um, and Seattle Young Poets took fifth in the nation, just so you know. We passed that on. Um, but the, the best thing about it was just seeing 400 young people getting together and speaking truth to each other via the spoken word, via poetry. So if anyone tells you the poetry is dead, you just tell them the kids are all right. They're all right. This is a poem about global warming. Um, there was a, a contest because it's a topic that, you know, maybe doesn't get written about enough as it should be and now so more than ever. It's called Human Causes. I'm going to move the podium. 
In the 1970s, they dropped the news like bombs over Baghdad. Before too long, the earth will burn. Scientists were countered and silenced. The phrase global warming erased in official documents. Today, the earth suffocates in swirling clouds of carbon dioxide. I know this feeling. Asthmatic since the age of three, when I would choke on my own breath, mom would hook me to the ventilator. But there's no solution like that for our planet. No giant ventilator in the sky we can steal from its orbit, nor can we stop Earth spinning long enough to place the mask over her gorgeous, cloud-covered face. A quarter of all children in Harlem have asthma. This is Homeland Security's most significant breach yet. Hurricane season a coming. Climatologists have made their findings, yet their hands are tied. The U.S. never ratified Kyoto, and now that the protocol's passed outdated, the temperature is rising, and secondhand smoke will kill more than a million species in our ecosystem. We will be extinct. How much more serious must this get, and why are the deciders gone golfing? Question. What is the difference between effect and effect? Answer, the global poor, those whom warming oceans and changing winds will affect most, and those who have had the least effect on the current ecological situation. How can we undo this, Gunners? Not global warming tied to a global war, both bred on their black gold and somebody's white ego, yet we still pump by the gallon with abandon, acting like there's a lot to waste. Environmental consciousness must be raised, so stop playing naive. Recycle like your life depends on it. Recycle because your life depends on it. If we promote only the use of renewable energy, force the automobile industry to cap emissions and rethink its greed, the survival of the planet becomes a commercial priority, for an uninhabitable world can buy and sell nothing. Some experts suggest more highway tolls, but let's hit the American people where it will hurt the most. Ask Fox News to disable the use of MySpace, cancel American Idol, and every single NASCAR race until the CO2 emissions rate drops 75% or more. The levels are rising every day. The tides are rising too. Melting ice sheets are predict predicted to increase sea level a half meter in this century alone. Coral reefs will be forced to give up the ghost. We both thrive at the, at the sea's surface, but the new depths may drown them with our hopes. If there is any chance of salvation to be had in legislation, let it not be our last resort. Anyway, I can take this mic off the hand. You know what's cool? I don't even need it. We're good. Um, I teach poetry.